We're going to dive in today with a little word, and I came ready and prepared. I'm feeling good. I hope I'm looking good. If not, blame my wife. She dressed me. So you see, check out the fit. But I'm excited. And uh, if you guys don't know, we just bought a house. We're about two weeks in now. Praise God. Praise God. We were like cramped up in a two-bedroom apartment. I- I'm going to tell you all something. Please don't report me to CPS for this. We have three children, and our youngest is a year old, and she literally lived in our closet. That was, we put her crib in our closet. So you should have seen me Sunday mornings, like, trying to, like, sneakishly open the door and, like, grab my clothes out of the closet. So I am telling you, God is faithful whenever he gives you a a new place to call home. So if you're believing, let that just go ahead and be a victory for you. (laughs) Go ahead and just receive it. Lord, give them a house as well. Whoever needs it. If they got a baby in the closet, give them a a house with an extra bedroom, Jesus. And so me and my wife, whenever we uh, were first starting to look at homes, we decided to build one. And we had found this home online. We saw the floor plan. And I was like, I like this floor plan. It's got just the right amount of space and everything it seems like. And so we went and we looked at the house, and whenever we drove up the sales rep, they'd meet us outside, and we get out, and I'm looking, and I'm like, I mean, it's nice, but it looks small. Like, all there is is a garage and a front door. Is there anything else to this place? And the sales rep looks back at us, and they go, hold on, just wait a second. Trust me whenever I say, it's bigger inside. And that's what I want to kind of lead in with today. It's bigger inside. I know that you may feel like just a normal person. You may feel like, well, it's just little old humble me, meek me. But God has a word that I want to prophesy over you today. You're bigger inside. You're bigger inside. Because who you are on the inside is not just who you are. It's everything God is as well. Amen? You're bigger inside. So that's what we're going to dive in with right now. Your appearance on the outside is not everything that you are. And Pastor Micah, he started touching on this last weekend. He talked about the power of the seed, the capacity of a seed. And the Bible even compares a seed to the kingdom of God, this tiny, tiny thing. And God says, hey, this little thing is like the entire kingdom of God. And it's not because it's small right now. It's because of the capacity. It's because of the power that's inside this thing. Don't underestimate it because it may look like one thing, but I'm already turning it into something else. Amen? Amen. Let's go ahead, dive in with Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Luke 10, verse 19. It says, look, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy, and you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. Would you pray with me for a moment? Heavenly Father, I thank you, God. I thank you for this authority that you've already given us, God. And I pray that we would understand it. We would walk in it. That we would have dominion in every single way over our life. That our circumstances would not dictate our outcome. But your power inside of us would go ahead and speak into our future. It's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 The power inside. You are bigger inside. And I know we talked about this verse here. It says, look, I've given you authority over all the power of the enemy. And then it continues on and it says, and you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. Before we go too far, disclaimer, we are not a cultish weird church. Uh, All right, we're not about to go into that, so let's just go ahead, set that aside. Let's save that piece of theology for later, okay? We're not bringing out the Kool-Aid from the kitchen, y'all. Because before we even get to that, God has something that we're missing first. He says, I have given you authority. And we're sitting over here worried about, what about those snakes and scorpions, Pastor Drew? What are you talking about with that? That's weird stuff. We're not talking about that right now. Let's talk about the authority that God has already given us, but we're not walking in yet. Because God has placed an anointing, he's placed an authority on our lives, and he's saying, I've called you into this, and guess what it does? It gives you power over the enemy. And we walk around sometimes just, it's a tough day today, I can't believe it, woke up late, so tired, not feeling good, my kids woke me up at 4 a.m., the enemy's got me, y'all, that is not the enemy, that is your children, and you prayed for them at one time, okay? (laughs) And it's time for us to step up and say, I'm not walking in defeat, 
the way that I get the victory that I want is by first receiving the authority that God has already placed on me, okay? And so I kind of want to go into this idea for a second. So what do you have authority over? You have authority to prophesy and speak to your future. If your life does not look the way that you want it to look, it's probably because you've already spoken a, a, a way that's contrary to what you really believe and what you really want. It's already come out of your mouth, and you may think, oh, well, I want to I have money, and I want to have a family, but you're over here talking about forever single. You prophesied it. Why are you single? It's not because you're crazy. It's not because you're weird. It's because you prophesied it. You may be a little weird and crazy, too, but I promise you there is crazy and weird out there that's going to fit perfect with you. It's not because of your circumstances. It's because of your prophetic voice. It's because of the authority that you've already walked in, right? Let's go ahead and dive in. James 4, verse 2. I didn't give them this verse, but I'm going to lead in with this one really quickly because it's powerful. It says, you have not because you ask not. Now, work, work, take it, flip it, and reverse it. You have, thank you. You have whatever you've asked for. So whatever you're walking in, the life that you're living right now is often a reciprocal of what you've already spoken of yesterday. The victory or the defeat that you have today is because you spoke it into existence yesterday. You're like, well, Pastor Drew, it's just a passing word. I'm just joking. You ever heard of sarcasm? Duh. I don't know. Has God ever heard of sarcasm? It doesn't say anything about sarcasm in the Bible, but it does talk a lot about authority. It talks about the power of life and death in our tongue, and that's what it says, and we may think it's a joke. Well, you don't really know how I feel. Aren't you taking this a little too literally here? It's not me. This is the word of God speaking. So what you say is what you will see. You want to see your future. It's shaped and framed by your words because your words will shape your world. The world that you live in is the prophetic voice that you've spoken before, right? So yesterday, or I'm sorry, today is a result of yesterday, and tomorrow is a result of what you've said and done today. So if you want to change your tomorrow, we've got to get ourselves in alignment today, okay? All right here. It's, it's just a joke. It's just a joke. I, it, you don't understand. It's sarcasm. That's just what people do. We joke about it all the time. Forever alone. Forever single. Uh, my kids are crazy. My wife is scary. I, whatever you're speaking today, that's what you're going to live in. You, you think I'm joking. I wake up sometimes and uh, it, it, Jenny will, you know, it, I, okay, I'm going to get in trouble right now. <laughs> I better go ahead and stop right there. Can I keep going? Oh, that, that's, a, that's, that's a no. <laughs> she shakes her head like this, but that means don't you dare. <laughs> but we'll have moments whenever you're like, man, this isn't the person that I want to see. And instead of speaking into her in a negative way, what do I need to do? I need to prophesy into my wife. I need to build her up. I need her to see herself as God sees her. And she's got to do the same thing for me because, y'all, I'm telling you, I am far from perfect. I know I look it. But I am far from perfect. And so my wife's got to prophesy into me. And she's got to speak to me as the man that God has called me to be. Not the man that I'm being in a moment. Because I can come home tired. And I can be frustrated. But she'll prophesy over me and she'll tell me, you have the mind of Christ. You walk in victory. You may feel stressed and overwhelmed. But I'm telling you, there is a peace of God that resolve, a resolve that lives inside of you. So receive it right now. She prophesies over me and I prophesy over her. And you're like, what are you talking about prophecy here? I'm talking about using encouragement to speak into your future. You don't have to have a vision. You don't have to be a genie in a bottle to be able to prophesy. That's not what we're talking about here. This isn't some weird mystical thing from a Disney movie. This is simply speaking encouragement into your future so that you can walk in the victory that God and pro the, the victory and the promise that God has for you. So that's what I want to give you today. Whenever you face opposition, I want you to overcome it by the authority of your actions and your words. Why is that? Matthew 12, verse 36. It says, and I tell you this, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word that you speak. So you think, well, I just said it as a joke. It really wasn't a big deal. 
I was just feeling it in that moment. It's not really what I mean or really what I think. Every idle word has power in it. And we're going to have to give an account for it. So let's change the way we speak. Let's change the way we think. Let's change the way that we act. And let's walk in the promise that God has for us. That's what I want to give you today. Three temptations whenever you face opposition. Because there are going to be things that come your way. Temptations. And there's, there's going to be two that you're like, oh, those aren't too bad. But they're wrong. It's not what God has for you. And then there's a final one that God's saying, this is what I'm speaking to you. We're going to go in with the story of Moses. And if you don't know the story of Moses, let me give you a little background check here. You ready? We've got this guy Moses, and he's an Israelite. And he's born in the land of Egypt whenever the Israelites are slaves to under Pharaoh's rule. So Pharaoh decides, he makes a proclamation, he says, hey, go out, kill every child, because I've heard that there's going to be a great deliverer that's going to rise up, and he's going to come out, he's going to set the Israelites free. So Moses is born, and his mother's like, "Uh uh-uh, you ain't having my baby, I'm protecting this thing, there is sanctity in this life here. And so she takes him, she weaves a little basket, she floats him down a river. Whenever he floats down the river, he makes it to Pharaoh's palace, and he's taken him by Pharaoh's daughter, and raised like a prince of Egypt. As he grows older, he discovers that he's not an Egyptian. He's actually an Israelite. And then whenever he sees an Egyptian beating an Israelite slave, he murders the Egyptian. He flees for his life after that, runs to a far, far away land. And at that point, he encounters God. God speaks to him through a burning bush. God forgives him. And he says, hey, by the way, I'm going to use you to set all of your captive uh, family members. They're all going to be set free through you. And most like, oh my gosh, I don't know if I can do that. I stutter, I'm nervous, I'm old, I can't do this. Don't take me back there. And God says, "Uh, gotcha, you're going to do it anyways, right? Don't argue with God. Just don't argue with him. So Moses goes back. He says, Pharaoh, let my people go. Pharaoh just looks at no. Ten plagues come upon him, right? Finally, Pharaoh gets the picture and he sets the Israelites free. And then at that point, we're coming to this moment where the Israelites, they're set free. They are walking. They're doing their little victory walk. All right, we're free. And they're heading towards the Red Sea. And they make it to the Red Sea. And then they turn over their shoulder and they look. And obviously, Pharaoh has changed his mind because he's coming after them. And he sent an entire army, his entire army, to come after the Israelites. He says, I'm not done with this. You're going to be a slave to me one way or another. And that's where we're picking up. So three temptations whenever we face opposition. Exodus 14, it says, As Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up, and they panicked when they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. They cried out to the Lord, and they said to Moses, Why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still in Egypt? We said, leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. And the number one temptation that's going to come your way, it's going to be the enemy will tempt you to go back. You see, whenever you encounter opposition, the enemy's going to tempt you to go back to your old ways. And you would think with these Israelites here, they would get it. They would realize, okay, we just came out and we saw 10 miracles happen right before our eyes. God's probably working for us, right? And then they step into this moment where they look over their shoulder and they see opposition. Fear overtakes them and they're like, just send us back. At least back there we were alive. Send us back to the bondage. Send us back to the slavery. And you're like, probably thinking right now, why in the world would they want to do that? But how many times do we do that? Do we romanticize the past? We look back and we say, God, would you get me out of this situation, this bad relationship, this abusive relationship that I'm in? Would you get me out of this job? Would you take me into my future? Would you take me to this next step? You may not even be saying what I'm in right now is really bad, but you're saying, God, would you take me into the next thing? And whenever you get to the next thing, you're like, ooh, this is a little overwhelming. I'd rather go back to how it was before. Can I please just go back? We romanticize the past here. Can you imagine seeing the miracle, wonder-working power of God at hand, and then the next moment you face a little bit of opposition, and you're like, take me back to the way it was before. Take me back into my slavery. Put me back in my bondage. Put me back there once again. We think, well, that's not me. But it happens. It happens. The devil attacks, and we're like, I'd rather not rise to this next level. I've got a target on my back, it feels like. I've started going to the church. I've started tithing. And as soon as I start doing that, the devil comes against me. And we immediately say, I'll just stop doing that. I can't do it. 
I can't go to church. I can't tithe. I can't give. I can't serve. I can't take that job anymore. I can't do this thing because it's too much for me. Our nature is to romanticize our past when we face trial in the present. But God tells us something different. He tells us, don't go back. As a matter of fact, it's found in one of the most disgusting verses in the entire Bible. Proverbs, you're like, uh, okay, I didn't know there were, it's gross. Proverbs 26, 11. As a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool repeats his foolishness. And we go back. We step back. We say, we take that one victory step and we're like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to start tithing. And then as soon as we start tithing, our finances come under attack. And we say, oh, never mind. I'm done with that. We say, I'm going to do it. I'm going to make sure my kids are raised in church. And then as soon as we take them to church, they go wild and they embarrass us. And we're like, I'm never going back to that church again. Right? We say, I'm going to do it. I'm going to start that business. And then that first quarter, it's like, ugh. It's rough. It's tough. I'd rather just go back to that old job. And we're not walking in the life that God has called us to because we faced a little bit of opposition. Don't go back. It's only the enemy tempting you whenever you're ready to go back. So don't do it. Don't be that fool that goes back to his foolishness. Step forward into what God has for you. Then Exodus, it continues along. Verse 13. But Moses told the people, don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just calm down. Now, I'm imagining Moses right here in this situation. He's probably like acting all cool and everything. He's like, hey, chill, relax. Don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you. And then nothing happens, and he turns around, and he's like, oh, my God. What are you doing right now? That's not using the Lord's name in vain. He's literally talking to God. <laughs> what are you doing right now? I just promised them that you were going to do something, and now you're not doing something. I told them, just stand still. Just stand still, just camp here, and then you'll do it again, right? And a lot of times, point number two, this is it. Man will tempt you to stand still, to just wait in that moment and hope that God comes through. And let me tell you, sometimes God does come through. Sometimes the answer is just stand still and watch God work. But in this situation here, God is not saying just stand still, He's wanting them to activate their faith in another way. He's wanting them to take authority. And so Moses is saying, stand still, just camp out. How often do we find ourselves walking through a valley, and then the only thing that we do is just, well, I'll just wait here, God. You better show up. Ten years go by. Fifteen years go by. Twenty years go by. I'll just hang out here. I'll just hang out in this place, this space. And you're like, God, you're begging God to use you, but you're not taking that next step in faith. And God is saying, I'm ready to use you. I've already put it on you. Now take the step. Walk in your victory. I've prophesied over your future. My will is very clear that heaven would be brought onto this earth. Why aren't you bringing it now? Bring it on, baby. Come on. God is telling us, don't just stand still. Don't camp out in your valley. Pastor Micah talked a little bit about it. He used the verse, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And it's telling us to just walk through it, to keep moving. But we're setting up tent, we're setting up camp, and we're waiting right there in this valley of death. And it's really not even a valley of death. It's just the shadow of death. It's meant to put us in fear, but it can't actually kill us. And so it's meant to freeze us, right? I got a story for this here, actually. My son, Ellis, I love him to death. He's three years old. And Ellis is my unpredictable child, Ellis is the one that you'll tell him not to do something, and he immediately goes and does it, right? So I'm like, if I want to get anything out of him, I have to use re reverse psychology. Ellis, don't you dare go and take a bath and obey me right now. Don't you dare do it. Don't you dare eat all your dinner, buddy. Don't you dare go to bed, right? And so he has this thing where he's been kind of sneaky lately. He likes to go into the pantry, and he likes to sneak snacks. And I'll find, like, an apple with, like, one bite taken out of it and then placed back in the basket, at least it's an apple, right? He's doing good in that front. But he'll go, and sometimes if I catch him, I'll see him. He'll, like, sneak it out, and he'll go and pull it out, and he'll go like this. And then I'll look at him and go, hey, Ellis. And he'll go, and he'll just freeze and stare at me with these giant eyes. And I'm like, what are you doing now? And he just freezes and acts like he can't be seen. Like, just waiting there, hoping that I'll pass along. He freezes in his moment, and I, I want to tell him, like, dude, if you really want it, 
If you really want it, that's fine. You better, like, grab it and run. <laughs> you would make the worst burglar in the world. Like, I, I am so glad that he is like that because that means he's going to have to do something good because Lord knows he'll never get away with anything bad, <laughs> that kind of sneakiness. He just freezes right there. How many times do we do that, though? We're walking in the victory that God has for us, and then we see the enemy come along, and we freeze in fear, and we just wait there hoping that he's just going to pass us by and let us go. Let me tell you, the Bible tells us that the enemy comes in like a roaring lion. He is on the prowl. He's not just going to watch you. Have you ever seen a lion just, just wait, just hang out? Hey, I hope you come and put yourself in my mouth right now. No, it is out there as prey trying to jump on you. So you better keep moving forward. Don't wait in that valley for your victory to come later. It's going to come by you climbing up the mountaintop. And yes, sometimes the grace of God will produce a miracle and he will just magically levitate you exactly where you need to be. But let's not wait for it because God is calling you into something greater. If you've ever heard the story of the elephant, the way that they train elephants, it's all a psychological game with them. And they'll take an infant elephant, a baby elephant, whenever it's young, they'll chain it to a post or a pole. And because it's young, it can't get away. It'll try and pull away. And as much as it tries, it'll never be able to pull away. So then whenever the elephant gets older, it's psychologically broken, and it believes that it has to stay and stand right there. So whenever it does get older, they don't chain it anymore. They just tie it with a little rope. And the elephant just feels that little bit of op uh, uh, opposition right there, and it'll just stay It'll freeze. This huge animal that has the power to destroy everything in its path will freeze right there. Why? Because of its past experiences. Its past experiences are dictating and telling it, you can't move forward. But God is saying there is an authority inside of you. All you have to do is break free of this small thing and then you can walk in the victory that I've already placed ahead of you. Don't wait for it anymore. Walk in your victory. Now, like I said, there's, that's not to say that there's not going to be times where God says, hey, just be still and know that I'm God. Just rest in my presence for a moment. Yes, you're going to need to rest. God will come through for you. But let's not just rest and wait whenever God is saying, hey, I've already put it ahead of you. My will is already ready to be done. Now you walk in it. That brings us Exodus 14, verse 13. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Well, I don't know, because you're God? Because of the 10 things you just did before? Why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. Pick up your staff and raise your hand over the sea. Divide the water so that the Israelites can walk through the middle of the sea on dry ground. Now leave that verse up there for a second because I want you to read something here. Let's read it carefully. Tell the people to get moving. Pick up your staff and raise your hand. Is God saying, I'm going to do it for you? No. No. Then he says, divide the water so that the Israelites can walk through. Does God say, then I'll divide the water? No. So who divided the water? Who was it? Was it God or was it Moses? It was Moses. Moses is the one that divided the water. And we think, oh, it was God. All Moses did was raise his hand and then God divided it. God said, no, I placed the authority of my power on Moses so that Moses could do what I've already equipped him to do. He didn't have to wait for me to do it for him because my blessing, my authority rested on his life. It wasn't a magical stick. It wasn't God doing it from heaven. It was Moses walking in the authority that God had already given him. So there's going to be times whenever God is saying, you know my will. My will is to bring heaven on this earth. My will is to see you start that business. My will is to see you raise up your children in a godly household. My will is to see you have a victory in your marriage and not end in divorce. And God is saying, but don't wait for me to do it for you. I've already given you the tools and God will never, he will never call you to do something that he hasn't equipped you for. God has already equipped you for this victory. So what if I told you that? What if I told you that everything you believed, everything you spoke would come to pass, whether it be good or bad, whether it be I, I, I will get this job, I will have a financial increase in my life so I can provide for my family, I will walk in victory in my health, I will overcome this addiction. What if I told you that all you had to do is speak it and believe it for it to happen? Would we do it? What would our world look like if that were the case? 
what would it look like? Would it look like that victory or would it look like sickness? Because we're always talking about, man, I just don't feel good today. Would it look like defeat? Would it look like poverty? Man, I'm, I literally have nothing in my bank account, nothing. What would our world look like if our words dictated exactly what the outcome was? Because I'm telling you, it will. Your life tomorrow is a result of the words you speak today, the authority that you walk in today. And there is a God-given power placed upon you. So what am I saying? Everything that you speak will come to pass. All you have to do is bippity-boppity-boo. All you have to do is, you know, rub your hands, click your heels, spin around three times, and then it's there. I mean, go for it. Give it a shot. I don't know. Here's what the Word says. You ready? You ready for the Word on it? If you remain in me, John 15, 7, if you remain in me and my words, my words, not your words, remain in you, you may ask for anything that you want and it will be granted. So are we really speaking God's words or are we speaking our own? Are we speaking man-made words? Are we speaking enemies' whispers? What are we speaking? Because if you speak God's words, you can say anything and it will come to pass. On the back side of this, on the flip side, God has a will. And if you speak your words in alignment with his will, it'll come to pass. Guess who else has a will? The enemy. He's got a will for your life. It's to see you broken and destroyed. It's to see you in death, hell, and the grave. And you can speak his will as well. And if you speak his will, you're going to end up in his place. I don't want to say that. You're not, nobody here is going to hell. You're all going to go to heaven in Jesus' name. If you're not, you're about to get saved right now. <laughs> Thank you. Someone's excited about that. But the authority of your voice ultimately aligns within what you speak through God's will or through Satan's will for your life. And whatever you speak, it will come to pass. We've got to carry ourselves in that way. So speak to your future. Prophesy your victory. Live the life that God has called you to live. But start it right now through your words and your actions. Let's not just wait for it anymore. So as we get ready to close here in just a moment, there was one big question that I always had whenever I was reading this passage. I always thought, God, you set them free. You brought ten plagues and demonstrated your glory just so that you could show them that whenever they got to the Red Sea, you'd let Pharaoh come and attack them again? Why in the world would you do that? And then I just kept reading down here, Exodus 14, verse 17, and God gives us the answer. He says, and I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they will charge in after the Israelites. My great glory will be displayed through Pharaoh and his troops, his chariots and his charioteers. When my glory is displayed through them, all Egypt will see my glory and know that I am the Lord. And that's whenever I got my answer. Why in the world would God set the Israelites free? He would deliver them into freedom, and then he would bring the enemy, he would allow the enemy to attack him again. It's not just that he allowed it. It says that he hardened the hearts of the Egyptians. God said, hey, I want them to come after you again. Why would he do that? Was it because he wanted the Israelites destroyed? No. Because as we continue down, what does it say? It says that Moses raised his staff, the sea parted, and the Israelites, they walked through on dry ground. The Egyptians, they began to follow them. And as soon as the last Israelites stepped out, they stepped onto that other bank, the other side, it says that the wall of waters came crashing down, and not a single member of the Egyptian army survived. You see, God allowed the enemy to come and attack them again so that God could destroy the very thing that held them in bondage. God didn't just want them to be set free. He wanted to make sure that they could never be followed again. And a lot of times we, we, we think, oh man, I'm facing this opposition. God, I thought you brought me here. I thought you brought me to this place so that I could finally have freedom from that addiction, from that lifestyle, from that mentality, from poverty. And God is saying, I did and this might be following you, but it's so that I can destroy it in a moment. All I'm doing is I'm giving you the opportunity to take the authority I've already placed on your life. 
All you have to do is reach out your hands towards heaven, walk through on dry ground, and get to the other side, and don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I'm taking you to what I promised you. I'm taking you to what I promised you. I want to invite everybody to stand up on their feet for a moment here. God can make a way. More than that, God will make a way, and he wants to make a way. But he might be speaking to you right now, and he might be telling you, I need you to take the next step. I need you to do whatever it takes. If it's a lifestyle of addiction that you're bound in, maybe it's time that you just get rid of that thing that you always go back to. If it's financial stress and struggles, maybe God's telling you, I want you to give out of poverty. You're not going to be able to collect your way out of poverty. I want you to give out of poverty. If it's apathy, I just don't really feel like going to church and being a part. Maybe you need to take the next step and not just attend church. You need to join the dream team. Maybe that's what God is calling you to do. To walk in your victory, you're going to have to take the next step in your authority. Wherever you're at, God's got an answer. And I want to see you walk in it. Online, I want to see you walk in your victory. So right now, I want to pray over you. And we're going to speak to your future. It, you may think it looks one way, but God has a plan for your life. Right now, I'm talking to you online. God has a plan for your life, and I want you to receive it right now. Would everybody just bow their eye, heads and close their eyes for a moment? And if this is you, I want you to just stretch your hands up. I want you to reach for it, and I want you to begin to prophesy into your future. I want you to prophesy your way into your victory. Jesus, I pray that every person in this room, whether they lifted their hands or they didn't, whether they were a little scared to or not, God, that you would speak to them right now, and they would see the will and purpose that you have for their life. Jesus, I pray that they would begin to bind their tongue that's going and speaking against their future, and they would begin to prophesy their own victory. That God, whatever you have called them to, if you've called them to start a business, they would step out in boldness. If you've called them to take a next step in tithing and giving, they would step out in boldness. If you've called them to servanthood, they would step out in boldness. If you've called them to victory in their uh, mentality whenever it comes to addiction, whether it be anything, whether it be a, a mindset, whether it be an addiction in their body, anything, God, that they would step out in victory. God, we speak to their future, and I rebuke the enemy that would try and lay hold of them right now, that when temptation comes, they would say, that is not what you have for me, God and they would rebuke it. They wouldn't go back into their old way of foolishness, but Jesus, they would take that next step and walk full force into your promised land. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. If you believe that, celebrate it for a moment, church. Celebrate it. I got good news, and that's that God's got a good plan for you. Sometimes it doesn't always start off with good news. Sometimes it, it may start off with bad news. It was a couple years ago, right around the time Pastor Micah had the same situation with his dad, Pastor Glenn. I got a phone call from my mom, and my mom tells me, Drew, I'm in the hospital right now, and your dad has suffered a severe heart attack. And the doctors are saying that they don't think he's going to make it. And in that moment, fear swept over me. She began to tell me how they said he had a blood clot that had made its way up into his heart and it had fully blocked off his heart over the course of the last several months. And at that point, in, uh, what is it, Necro necropsy? It, it, it had started to die. His heart had literally started to die. I know we've got a doctor in here somewhere, a nurse that's telling me what to say. <laughs> and so in that moment, fear came into me. And I was like, oh my gosh, we're about to lose this man. And that fear would have taken control unless I had had a community of believers that surrounded me. I had pastors and friends that began to surround me. And together we began to pray and prophesy over him. They said his heart attack, it was called the widow maker. They said less than 1% of people survive it in the end. And they said, here's what we're looking at. To survive this, he's going to need a heart transplant. And we don't have a donor match for him right now. And so we began to speak over it. They said, we said, he's not going to die. He will live and he will declare the faithful works of the Lord. And they came back and they said, okay, we just discovered he won't need a heart transplant, but he is going to need bypass surgery. 
And so we began to speak and pray again. And we came back again and they said, okay, he's actually not going to need bypass surgery, but he's going to need to stay in the hospital for the next several months so that we can monitor him. And then we began to pray again, and they said, okay, actually, something crazy has happened. Um, he's actually doing great. We're just going to send him home with a little bit of medication because you wouldn't believe what happened. You see, an artery had actually grown around to the other side of his heart and began producing blood flow. So he didn't need a heart transplant. He didn't need bypass surgery. God said, I'll do this on my own. But how did it start? Because the enemy came in and they spoke one thing. They said, it's going to be death. But God said, use your mouth and prophesy life. And we began to do it. And Jesus Christ himself came into that room, I believe. And he orchestrated his hand. The great physician performed the work that needed to happen. And the devil may have said, your dad is finished. But Jesus said, no, he's not because I already finished it 2,000 years ago. This is a finished work, but it's not on Satan's terms. There is a finished work for your life. And it all starts through placing your trust in Jesus. This is the most important decision you can make with your life. If that's you, you're in this room, you're joining us online. I want to lead you in that prayer. The Bible says that if you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and you confess with your tongue that he died on the cross and rose again, then you will be saved. I can't believe for you, but I can lead you in the confession part. So I'm going to ask everybody again now to bow their heads. And if that's you and you're ready to receive salvation, you are ready to make heaven your home, you are ready to make God's will your promise and your future, you're ready to make him your heavenly father, this is your moment. Don't let it slip by. On the count of three, I want you to raise your hands. You ready for this? One, two, three. Go ahead and lift your hands up right now. If you're ready to receive salvation, I see those hands. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. You're about to walk in your victory. Online, this is for you as well. Now, as a church, can we all just take our hands? I want to invite you to place it on your heart, and I'm going to lead you in this prayer. And if you're inviting Christ into your life, would you just say this? But say it with power. Say it with meaning. Make this your prayer, not mine. Say, Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord and be my Savior. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe that you died on the cross and that you rose from the grave. So change me. Make me new from the inside out. Change the way I think. Change the way I talk. Change the way I th act. Jesus, because of you, I walk in victory. That your promise is my future. And that heaven is my home. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Can we celebrate that for a moment?